Welcome everybody to the last webinar in this year from IDQ. My name is Axel Furry. I have the honor to lead the quantum safe business in IDQ. And uh, today the topic is a quite interesting one. It's about quantum technology's impact on the automotive V2X security. And I would even add architecture on this. So what does it mean? I think we are not coming from the automotive industry, obviously, we are coming from the security side, but we know a lot about quantum technology and we know a lot about security. And we want to provide you today, our view, how you can participate on the great quantum technology we provide and is usable in the automotive space. With me today is on one hand, our director for strategic quantum initiatives, Bruno Hüttner, and hello. hello bruno and our senior director for curanchi global business development tom stengel out of the us hello. welcome tom thank you so and having said this i want to hand over to you tom to run the show okay and before we dive into it i want to remind everybody that uh, there is a box on your screen to enter questions and if you enter the questions while bruno and i are taking you through the information um, we've allowed plenty of time at the end to go through questions and review them with you. And then if you don't mind sticking around, we have a, just two short polls uh, just to help us improve our webinars for the future. Having said that, we're going to just switch over purely to the slides here on our uh, webinar cameras. So the, uh, today we're going to be talking about the quantum technology predominantly. And I, I want to talk about with you that quantum technology is here now. And we're going to go through that, what the quantum technology is and how it specifically is applied today in, in terms of approving, improving security. And then very specifically, why that, where it matters in the automotive space and, and where it can be applied in the automotive space um, for the quantum technology in the security. And there's a lot of stuff you might see out there in the news and whatnot on quantum technology, but there isn't one quantum technology. Quantum technology is like so many things in high tech. There's a lot of different applications for quantum physics and quantum technology, including quantum sensing, uh, even for automotive, uh, making sensors using quantum technology that'll be a leap forward and improvement of what you're doing today. And ID Quantique has products in that space. You can find them on our website. Uh, today, we're gonna talk more about quantum security, which is what Bruno and I do. Um, it, it, but, you know, the things you hear a lot about are in quantum computing. And you'll even hear about things like the Google researchers last October who came out with NASA with a big announcement and they came out uh, with a counter announcement from IBM. And most of that's about quantum computing, but don't get fooled to think that's the only quantum technology out there. And in fact, Tom, it's not the only thing. Uh, very, very recently, actually uh, last week, uh, the Chinese also reported that they have demonstrated what they call, and uh, I think the term is better, quantum advantage. So you also have to understand that quantum is not only European or American, but uh, actually the Chinese are very strong. And I think they have uh, clearly demonstrated the quantum advantage on a very special kind of computer. So quantum is everywhere. It's already everywhere. That's a great point. And the other thing is, it's now. It's not about the future. When you hear about supercomputers that can change the world, that may be uh, two, three, five, seven years away. But the quantum technology is now. In fact, it's already in um, some cell phones and being in people's pockets, including mine, people around the world already are using quantum technology, and in this case, in the cell phones for quantum security, very much like what we're going to talk to you about today uh, in, the, uh, in the automobile. Do you know, I, the quantum safe technology, meaning just for security, has been chipping uh, for 20 years now. And largely, for many years, it was big data centers, telecommunications, equipment, financial, uh, institutions, but over the years, each successive generation of technical development with the quantum technology and product development has shrunk it and shrunk it and shrunk it, reduced the cost, reduced the power consumption. So today it's already in mobile phones and Internet of Things devices and beginning to get used in the automotive space. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about today 
about in the automotive, there's there's a basic two basic pieces where we uh, where quantum technology can apply for quantum security. This is all separate from quantum sensing, which is its own use of quantum technology in the automobile. For the quantum security, there's the communications, the V2X, the vehicle to anything communication. That's that's the main thing. That's the main place today where people are trying to manipulate, eavesdrop, replay, inject bad stuff. And, and really every system in the car, every in-vehicle system in the car is its own attack point. And you know, the automobile may have a central ECU controlling it, but each subsystem in the in the vehicle can be viewed very much like an app on a phone. Uh, from the point of view of a hacker trying to hack it through the V2X link, it's very much like trying to hack something in your phone or your laptop through the, the website. There's, it doesn't look much differently than a laptop or a cell phone to a hacker when you open up a car with a V2X communication and in-vehicle systems. So we're going to talk to you a little bit now about the quantum technology itself and how it can be applied. Yes. So. Uh... Why do you need randomness? I mean, the first thing really, we are going to talk to you about randomness, so we have to explain why we need to do that. The thing is that randomness is a, the basis, is that really the basis of every cryptography. So whenever you exchange some information with somebody, or when your uh, car would exchange information with something else, V2X, these systems, in order to be secure, will use cryptography. And the base of cryptography is so-called, is the key. The key is really a long string of numbers, which you will use in order to guarantee the security of the transaction you are, go you are doing. The idea that the key has to be secure is uh, not, uh, not very recent. Uh, Kirchhoff did uh, express his principle more than 150 years ago. Okay? And the principle is really, you need a key and you need a secure, you need a unique and a random key. And that's really why we will discuss randomness today, because you will need to have this random key. Of course, having a random key is just a first step, it's not enough. You need, of course, to store this key, to distribute, to manage. We're not going to go through all that. Today, we are going really to focus on this basic building block. How can you get a random key which you can use in automotive security? Okay, so next slide. Well, I would just say that uh, it's it's funny you mentioned that uh, Kirchhoff was more than 100 years ago. Even even Albert Einstein and his interactions with Max Born on quantum physics worked very specifically and wrote quite a bit about randomness. So so these ideas are not new. Just the ability to harness the quantum randomness and shrink it and make it useful is what's newer. Well, in fact, actually, uh, Einstein, what is interesting in what you said is that Einstein was actually did not believe in randomness uh, from quantum. And of course, it's the one of the few places where he was wrong. And for, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. It's just a fact. But yeah, Max actually, now, that was yeah. part of Max Born, uh, what he did. He actually uh, yeah. put it in Einstein's face that he was wrong on the randomness. Absolutely. Um, so let, let's back to keys today. And I, I just wanted to, to, to give you a very... Uh, amusing idea that all keys are not equal, obviously. You can get a key which everybody can copy and it will be very easy to do. And for us, we are not dealing with uh, physical keys, but with uh, digital keys. Of course, a bad key like that would be a zero, 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 or some kind of number which anybody can guess easily. Of course, a better key is something which is random. So it doesn't look like anything. And the more random, the better, because nobody can guess which kind of key you're going to use. And that's the kind of keys we need in our system, and especially in automotive security, as I will show in the next slide. So how do you get this randomness? OK, we need these random keys. And it's not so easy, actually, to get randomness. If you take a classical system, a classical system behaves what we say deterministically. It means that if you decide, if you find the initial condition of a system, let's say an oscillator or something, you define it well enough and you let it evolve. Classical system evolve deterministically. You, you can really find out how the system will evolve and find exactly the way it will be in a few minutes or more and more and more. So it's not so easy to get randomness from classical systems. So how do you do that anyway? One of the ideas is to try and get what we call external noise. So you got your system, and somehow it is coupled to the external world, and the external world will send some kind of noise in the system which will make it evolve in a way 
which you cannot predict. Okay, so using external noise is not a bad idea, but you have some problems with that. First one is that it may have hidden regularities. For example, when we talk about electromagnetic noise, like radio or something, which is coming in, it may look random, but maybe it's not. Somebody can manipulate it, or even you can have some natural uh, frequencies which come more often than others, and what looks random may not be uh, really random. Even worse than that, in some places, and I think it's exactly what we will have in IoT, for example, you cannot get external copying. You have your very small computer somewhere, which is somehow protected from the external world. And in this case, how do you get noise from outside? You want to shut your system from the external world and you don't get noise coming in. So you don't have always noise coming from the outside world. So the other possibility is what is a what is known as chaotic behavior. So you have a classical system and you let it evolve. And of course, the, the evolution is deterministic, as I said before. But in some cases, if the behavior is chaotic, it means very clear, very quickly, you lose the possibility to be able to predict what it's going to do. And it will evolve in something which looks very, very random. That works really nice in most cases because this chaotic behavior is actually well understood and people can find out what's going on. However, we have now new mathematical techniques which allow us to predict chaos better than we expected before. So if you take a chaotic system, you think, it's you think the behavior will give you some random numbers quickly, but if somebody comes back a bit later and have a better technique to look at the behavior of this system, he may be able to predict the behavior. And then, of course, he will know what's going on. And your system will not give randomness anymore. And one of the things which you have also to realize is that we have now the quantum computer coming. And quantum computer gives you a lot of new computing power. So you could really take a chaotic system. And if you can use a quantum computer to predict its behavior, you may also find out that it's really not random. So basically, it's OK to use randomness from classical system, but you have some problems with that. And in order to avoid these problems, you can go to quantum. Quantum is really giving you pure randomness from something which is today very small, not coupled to the external world, and intrinsically within the heart of your system, as we will see in a moment, you can get real randomness. And that's why we advocate using quantum random number generator. Next slide. And of course, we want to talk about, when you talk about the hidden regularities that can be there if you're using this classical approach that people have been using successfully for a long time. But now when you're putting something, let's say in the automobile, you're actually, there's a lot of regular, uh, hidden regular sources in an automobile, everything, you know, from things in the engine and things in every one of those in-vehicle electrical subsystems that are creating, you know, periodic signals, which is, which adds regularities and you don't want regularities added into the randomness. It makes it less random or not random and that makes it um, hackable. That's interesting because it's true that uh, in uh, in a system with uh, with mechanical system, you do have probably lots of noise, vibration, and so on. But as some as I just say, they may not be random enough for us. For us, and that's why yeah. if you put this quantum stuff inside, it's better. So, as we told earlier, Einstein was wrong. On quantum physics, is actually undetermin non deterministic. It means that if you take a quantum system, you can extract randomness from it without a worry that something will change, okay? Something external or internal will modify this randomness. A quantum state, a quantum system can be in intrinsically random and give you true randomness. What we do at ID Quantic with our system is to use one particular quantum system. Obviously, you have to choose, and this quantum system is simply light. So we put a beam of light and we look at the photon distribution of this beam of light, and quantum mechanics is telling us this beam of light, even if you do the best possible one, would always have noise in the photon distribution. And this is what we put here on this curve as the Q. The width of this curve is given by quantum. On top of this quantum noise, you can add some excess noise, which is, for example, fluctuation, classical fluctuation in the light. But even if you had a very a perfect one, you would still have this basic randomness in the number of photons which can be 
detected in, the, in your beam of light. And that's exactly what we are going to use in our system, which we will show in the next slide. And here we wanted very briefly to explain how it works. So you got the light source and you got a sensor. What is interesting here is that the sensor is not something special. What you have, every phone today has a camera. And this camera is so great, so good, that the sensor in this camera is at, works at the quantum level. It means that the fluctuation in the number of detection you got in each of your pixels is actually mostly coming from quantum. And this is something which cannot be avoided. So we are almost perfect in our sensors like in the phones, and that's the kind of sensor we are using in our uh, quantum system, in our QRNG. And this gives you pure randomness. Of course, we need to work a bit of it to remove the classical noise and so on. And that's what we do in the next step, like ADC, analog, an, an analog to digital converter, some filtering. We have also ways to check the health status to make sure that what we give will be truly random. And from that, we can extract the what is called quantum entropy. So it's really what is coming out directly from the sensor. The sensor being a physical system, obviously it's not yet perfect, so if you really want uh, key or randomness you can use directly, we go through a mathematical process and we uh, extract real random data at the end. We call it post-processing. And, and I think brain. it's important to notice that it's all inside of one device, that there's no external. There's a little you know, in, in, light source, sensor, filtering. It's all inside of one device. And it's actually a family of devices, the smallest of which is 2.5 millimeter square, one millimeter thick. So in terms of implementing it into uh, the automotive space, it, it's a package that's very suitable for the automotive space. Yeah, and th that's really interesting. Again, it's because the technology of the sensing, like these cameras you have in your phone, and it's the same camera we have in our small chip, you can put everything in something which is that small and totally uh, cut from the external world. So in this metal box, you have everything you need and outside of it would simply come out these random numbers from the moment you switch on and forever, basically, as long as it's working. Okay, so that's really the way we do it at ID Quantic with our systems. Next. Yes, here I wanted to uh, think about a little bit timing issues. Because if today you want to put in your car or in a, any automotive system a new, a new component, the thing is that this comp in automotive industry you have a very long life cycle. It means you decide today to put something new. By the time you have it in the car, it's probably a few years. And then it has to work for 10, 15, 20 years. So the system itself has to work for 10, 20 years, which you, know, you can test and you can make sure that it will work for a long time. But the technology you are using also should be valid for 20 years. And again, if you think back to what we discussed earlier about the classical uh, systems which can give randomness, how do I know that my classical system today, which is using a chaotic system uh, uh, to provide randomness, maybe in 10, 15 years, by evolution of the uh, processing uh, computer uh, power and so on, you might be able to actually forecast. So the system would still work, but people could know what kind of numbers my random number generator would extract. And that's a really big worry. So it's better to take something which you know will not depend on the evolution of computing power and so on, and decide you can put it in your car. How do you manage to make sure that you put things which will stay? Well, you have, you've got two possibilities. One is to have flexibility, to be able to replace it. If something you know that in 15 years it may not be OK, you can remove and replace it. That works for software, and you will have upgrades probably all the time. But it's much harder to remove hardware. To change the hardware in a car which is on the road, uh, it's not something you would like to do uh, if you can avoid it. And that's why, again, choosing quantum to generate randomness, ensure that the randomness is here now and will stay forever. As long as the system is working, it will provide good randomness. It doesn't depend on the evolution of computing power, what's around it. Next. Yeah, I just think I, I would add to that, that um, there are things that were projected to be three, five, 10 years into the future, which Google last October, the Chinese government announcement this week, 
uh, happened much sooner than we originally project projected. So it, it even saying 10 to 15 years, it could very easily some of these things be two to five years. So just the bottom lines before we go to much more practical things. So the, the, basically the idea is you need randomness in order to get security wherever you're using it, cryptographic security. This randomness can be provided, best provided by quantum technologies. So you use this very small chip to generate these true random numbers. You can then use these random numbers to generate strong keys. And hopefully with these strong keys, you can generate a secure crypto system, which, can you, which you will use to make any kind of transaction in your car, and especially between the car and the outside world, the famous V2X, which we are uh, looking at today. It's, it really is all about making you know, the longest lasting, highest trusted key, which is the cornerstone, the foundation of all crypto security today. I'm gonna take a moment just to remind everybody that there is a place to enter questions uh, in the webinar tool, uh, and that we did allow plenty of time at the end to go through those questions. So just a reminder to get those entered in as they occur to you. Having said that, we're gonna go into now, like, be, like Bruno said, more practical in terms of how to use it. And that starts with pretty, pretty straightforward implementation today, whether it's the ECU in your car or whatever particular implementation is going into vehicles uh, to control the V2X communications and to oversee all the in-vehicle subsystems. And generally speaking, those processors all have some, some strong commonality. They have a you know, central processing unit built in memory, general purpose IO built in, and uh, almost always the encryption is built into the system on a chip processor these days. And, and that's not just for automotive, that's very similar computing, IoT, mobile. You know, I've had people comment to me how much the electronics in a mobile phone and the electronics in an automobile are starting to uh, conceptually look more and more the same in some ways. And today, if you have a file, uh, a data, a piece of data in the car that needs to be encrypted or a communication channel, the V2X communication channel, whichever communication channel that is to the outside the vehicle, um, and, and it needs to be encrypted, you know, the CPU hands that job to an encryption engine, whether it's a data file or setting up the channel. And the encryption engine uh, creates a key and it creates that key using a random number generator that's embedded in and it's very easy to add the IDQ chip. You solder it down on, onto the board next to the existing system on a chip processor. It connects straight in through a couple of different bus options for connecting straight in that we have found so far in every processor that we've looked at in these spaces like automotive and phones and IoT. And, uh, and it's pretty straightforward that when the CPU now has to encrypt either a piece of data that's being transmitted or the actual channel. Now it, it, it still reaches the encryption engine inside of the SOC and the encryption engine still is gonna create a key for this activity. And that key now is gonna be generated using the quantum random number generation from the IDQ chip instead of the internal random number generation chip. Actually, Tom, maybe we should be, uh, some people would be afraid of that if we, if we replace what they know by something else. So maybe what, what we have to uh, specify is that in, in most cases, we do not replace the random generator that you already have in your system, but we add our own, our own randomness. And the theory says that if you mix two randomness together, you have the best of, 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 the, of both, basically. If one fails, the other is here to replace, and you cannot lower the randomness by mixing two different kinds. And in most cases, when you have a very secure systems, actually, not maybe in this one, but when you have complicated system and you need a very high security, people mix randomness from very different sources in order to make sure that whatever happens will create a good randomness at the end of the day. So by adding this QRNG in the system, you simply improve and there is no way you can lower the security in the system. That, that's a great point. It's, uh, it, it is for those people who have a little bit of extra engineering effort available to, to blend the two random numbers, um, it, does add, uh, it does add one level of security, which is as rare as it is, if one of the random numbers failed or had an issue, 
you 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 would still be uh, moving along with the random number generation. Um, you certainly can replace it with a QRNG, uh, but as Bruno just said, majority of the designers take the extra time to blend the two together instead of using one or the other. Then from a software point of view, very straightforward. It's pretty standard looking software stack. This is for Windows or Linux. This one's for Android. We provide the chip drivers and, and it's pretty standard implementation from a software point of view. There's nothing special or unique about using our chip drivers compared to any other chips that you are using in your design. Um, we also have uh, get into some people, in particular in the automotive space, instead of using dedicated encryption inside of a processor, uh, including key generation, they are using a secondary chip, either a hardware security module or a trusted uh, a module for generating the keys and for managing the keys. And again, it's really the same thing here. If you If you are using the HSM or the TPM to generate the keys, uh, for your data security and for your transmission, you are still using an internal random number generator uh, to generate those keys. That internal random number generator, it's in the automobile, it's subject to some of the vibrations and some of the things, electromagnetic things in that uh, automobile, which are periodic. They are not actually random. They are uh, periodic signals. So they there are is potential problems there. And just by adding in the QRNG into the HSM or the TPM, you immediately get the same benefit we talked about on the previous slide for uh, using it with a, a system on a chip processors encryption engine. And again, yeah, actually, the quantum does the rest. Yeah, actually one of the things that if you have a little bit of processing, uh, you will probably use a system on a chip with best randomness inside but as soon as you got many systems i think the architecture will probably move towards having all these systems and having a centralized source for generating randomness and also using this for key generation and basically for all cryptographic purposes a hardware security module is exactly that that instead of having the security you know a little bit everywhere which may be harder to ensure you put all your efforts into having this very strong hardware security module where you got all your cryptography, and then you use this uh, around everywhere in the car. And that's even more important, of course, than to have a good uh, randomness source within this HSM or TPM. Yeah, and I think I think it's a good point. We've we've taken the effort when we made the uh, when we make these QRNG solutions to make sure they work in either kind of an architectural approach, either the fully distributed approach where you're going to put it in every system subsystem, or the more centralized approach where you're going to have one uh, trusted key management uh, device uh, servicing all of the uh, subsystems in a vehicle. So why is it uh, being driven? What's the urgency to, to do this thing? And what it comes down to is it with the automotive, and this is from data collected uh, from 2010 to 2018, is that the amount of time a hacker spends trying to hack a connected automobile is skyrocketing. And that's largely because more and more vehicles are becoming connected and more and more of the connected vehicles are having uh, more and more communications instead of just a simple communication it is becoming a V2X communication where the car can communicate to many things, not just one connection to one, one place on the other side of the connection. And, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of impacts of cyber attacks. You know, the, the biggest and most frightening one is somebody takes over the car. And if they take over that car and they are a bad person, they, they can do something that's very unsafe and harm the passengers. It, but there's a lot of different kinds of impacts of cybersecurity, stealing the car, stealing your data that's, that's being collected by all these electronic systems in the car. And right on down the list, even, even tracking you when you don't want to be tracked, um, as an example. So there's a lot of different impacts. It, and all of these things are obstacles to the growth of the market of connected cars. It, and you would think uh, that that the obstacles, of course, ops, a lot of effort spending, spent on safety concerns, always, and a lot of effort spent on cost, making it affordable, always, in, in, in adding new features. But but in checking and in, in, in doing a poll on it, the, the number one obstacle that's judged to be slowing down 
uh, the growth of connected cars, actually cybersecurity and privacy concerns of having a car that becomes as fully connected as a cell phone and begins looking like a cell phone with all the apps, with all the functions in a car being like apps on a phone. And, and we get into, you know, what are those cyber attacks for the V2X and what is the detection probability? And some of them are pretty low. It, it's very difficult to know somebody's e eavesdropping or a GPS spoofing. And of course, some of them are very easy to know, denial of service. If somebody uses an attack to make it so your car doesn't run and it's just sitting there unusable, that you, you've detected it, but you have a huge problem. It, it, there's actually more than these. These are sort of seven of the worst uh, case cyber attacks on the V2X channel. And these are all things where the uh, QRNG can uh, increase the make it quantum enhanced security to greatly decrease the ability of a hacker to be able to do any of these things. You know, there's a there's there's an expanding attack surface for hackers to get at a car. All of these things on this diagram are very valid, good things for a car to be able to do. You want the car in the future to be able to interact with, with uh, pedestrians on the street. Everyone's gonna have a cell phone, most everyone does today. If a car can sense there's a cell phone there, even if it doesn't know who the person is, it it's it can know there's a pedestrian about to cross the street. So it's that much more likely to be able to make good decisions to stop or to give you information if you're driving the car, if it's not an autonomous vehicle, or, or the parking spot. You want to go for parking and you pull into a neighborhood and three parking lots are full and one has spaces and your car just tells you there's, there's so many reasons why V2X is valuable, but it does expand the attack surface and make more places available and therefore needs to be protected from hackers. And, and where we do that, where the implementation is, you know, Bruno spent time talking about about why it's a great technology and about how it makes security stronger. and uh, and, and this is more about where the implementation is. In there's, you can actually implement it in any in-vehicle system, and there are some people already designing QRNGs into in-vehicle systems, but the fundamental choke point is still the V2X communication. And in using that uh, to communicate it, you, you are greatly increasing your ability to keep a hacker from being able to do something with a car. And there's a huge cost to that. The cost of failure is huge. Just the famous Jeep hack that so many people know about, 1.4 million vehicles, it costs $560 million to fix the infotainment system in, a, in the Jeep. That's one simple hack, a minor hack, and yet the potential devastation of it was so great, it cost $560 million, plus of course the loss of, of uh, we talk about the loss of, uh, prestige and esteem so implementing you know, it you know you know Sorry, Tom, I... that uh, in, in in many instances hack can be linked to weak keys not all of them but in many cases that was really the fact that uh, uh, when people manage to hack into a system it's because the keys were not secure enough so i think it's very important of course you need all the other uh, system to be good i mean you need your cryptography behind it to be good but if you start with a weak key whatever you do afterwards is useless Yep, that's absolutely fantastic point. Should also add that we, it is a family of products, and there is, uh, like in this case, this device here is a state of the art for is already certified for automotive space and compliant to the requirements that the automotive industry looks for when they use a semiconductor chip. And you know, the bottom line is, uh, studies have shown that in 92% of the companies report an increase in sales or product usage if they can demonstrate to their customers that the product is more secure. And, the, and, and at a very fundamental level, it, it drives trust and it drives customers to, to buy more and use more. And the best part is it's available today. It's already shipping. And in my case, it's already in my pocket. You know, it's already out there. It's not, it's not the future, it's available today. And uh, before we go to the questions, I'd like to take a moment to um, point out uh, the SAE. Uh, Edge Reports, um, the, the Society for Automotive Engineering, is today releasing uh, these research report, report led by uh, Dr. Joachim Tabor, the unsettled topics concerning the impact of quantum technology and automotive cy cybersecurity. Bruno and I were both proud to participate in, uh, in this research report, and uh, it's up in, uh, on today on the SAE 
uh, published, yeah, no, published tech papers. What is interesting here is that uh, SAE is already thinking about that. I mean, that, that was something a few years ago we would we would have thought that it would take a long time before in automotive industry people would start paying attention to quantum technology and the impact, uh, both on the bad side, quantum computer, and on the good side, that how we can improve the security. But it's here today. I mean, these guys want to know what's going on. And I think Dr. Tabor has done a, a great job in trying to explain how to use quantum technology in automotive cybersecurity. Fantastic. So the, these products are not new. They've been out for 19 years, um, but they've only recently shrunk down to a small enough size with low enough power consumption and inexpensive enough to be useful in places like mobile phones, Internet of Things, automobiles, and things like that. And having said that, this uh, just is one thing, uh, Tom. I think you, your our engineer has done a really good job in trying to do that. You know, shrinking yeah. this uh, big box into something which is a few millimeters. I mean, we we think it's normal and natural, but uh, I think uh, hats hats off to these guys because they yes. really managed to do a great job putting this in such a small uh, form factor and also uh, now today very good quality and robustness i think and, and 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 i would add to that in addition to we always go for best in class performance and trust highest level of trust in our security solutions but our engineering team did a tremendous job of coming up with operational simplicity to use the chip the the ease of ability for uh you to use a design in a design that you are doing in the automotive space um, operational simplicity is equally important to the to the quality of engineering and the high level of trust uh, that we inject in all of our security products. And with that, I'm going to bring it back over to uh, Axel to review some of the questions. Bruno and I will try to answer them for you today. Um, maybe put back on my webcam as well. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Tom. I think very impressive. Uh, a lot of content. Uh, the good thing is we record this. You can get access to the data and the information shared today. But we also received some questions, right? So which is quite good. Uh, the first question, I'm not sure I think I take it to Bruno, is about the PQC and QRNG. What is the relationship? Because for sure a lot of people think, okay, maybe mathematical approach will become better and will cope with the quantum threat and also the general threat on security because it's not only about quantum threat obviously and can we provide something on this and what's our statement bruno so i think i, I would take uh, five seconds to bring our audience to uh, all the acronyms because there may be a, a bit too many uh, basically the idea is that the quantum computer will attack most of existing cybersecurity systems. And people are now looking at what can be done. And of course, one of the things that can be done is to use what is called post-quantum crypto, PQC. Post-quantum crypto is the new crypto, the new mathematical stuff you will use in order to get a good security. And this should be resilient to the quantum computer. But in both cases, the starting block is still good randomness. So whatever you want to use, whatever crypto you put in your system, you can use still the old fashioned, if I shouldn't say old fashioned, but the modern crypto, which is used today. You can go to post quantum. You can uh, think maybe of other ways to do it in the future, but all of these systems will require good randomness to start with. And in fact, uh, strangely enough, PQC actually needs way more randomness than yeah. standard crypto. If you just to, to have a, to explain that, in order to do uh, cryptography with, uh, uh, let's say, RSA crypto system, you just need a large random number. You just need a large prime number, okay? And that you can find. Uh, with post-quantum crypto, you need to, to generate matrices of random numbers. So you need many, many more randomness. So whatever you, you, whatever you plan to use for your crypto, make sure you use good randomness to start with. And with PQC, you will need more of it. Thank you, Bruno. And uh, maybe it's one thing to consider, especially also in the car, processing power is still a limited good and uh, generate randomness costs processing power. And if our chip, uh, you don't need this processing power because you get the randomness out of the chip, obviously. Um, That's um, correct, because of Yes, <laughs> thank you, Bruno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good if I can give the right answer. Uh, I think we are already a little cautious of time. 
I want to uh, give the other poll open to Catherine to handle the poll so that we get some feedback on your actual view. Uh, maybe Catherine, can you share the first poll? Thank you. So do you have an encryption project coming in the coming months? I think most of you will have to some extent. Please let us know what's the time frame, and uh, because it's always good to understand what's the demand side. In the meantime, I will share some thoughts about this this chip because uh, I think it's a, it's a really interesting journey we are going through. You see the devices going uh, from a big box to a small chip. We have now we are entering the million stage of QR and T chips. We are clearly the number one on the global market, providing uh, quantum randomness. And for sure, we see a hockey stick in demand from all areas, servers, network equipment, uh, mobile phones, and hopefully as well, the uh, cars. Uh, we have already started to discuss for sure. And uh, that's the reason why we're so happy to share this uh, with a broader audience so that everybody can use this great technology. So Catherine, uh, what's the outcome results. so far? Okay, yeah, the so the, re the results are 30% say yes in the coming six months and 30% say yes in the coming 12 months. Uh, so a lot of projects coming along, 10% in the coming 18 months, and then we have 30% not yet or no. So that's okay. the first poll. So, so I hope that for the 70% we have provided already some good information they can use. So maybe go to the next poll. This is the important one, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So because you know we, we you have, uh, tell us tell us what you yes. what uh, what you think. Yeah. So what do you think about the webinar? Does it ex reach your expectation? We have a series of webinars. It's the last one. It's so to say the Christmas edition. Uh, for sure, we we'll go for a further series next year. And um, but we would like to get your feedback. Uh, is this interesting? And uh, be honest so that we know uh, where we have to work and to improve, if if possible, right? So in general, I think we covered a lot of segments, and uh, maybe next year we will go even more in applications because that's for sure quite interesting as well, because we see huge value which you can maybe even get paid back by your customer. So that's something that we considering going forward. Catherine, what is the the outcome so far? Uh, the the result is 90% yes and 10% no. And there are always some people which challenge us and that's great. Thank you very much for your feedback. And I would say big thank you to uh, Bruno and to Tom for handling this, uh, presenting this great content, for Catherine to setting up and for all of you for attending. I wish all of you uh, hopefully good year end and also uh, nice Christmas uh, time and safe and secure for sure as well and healthy, which is most important. So stay healthy and we see us next year on this webinar series from IDQ. Thank you very much. Have a great Thank day, you. great afternoon. Thank Take you, everybody. Evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.